Let me just begin the conversation framing climate and where we're at today. Uh, if you and I were standing on a shore and there was a tsunami coming, we'd be like, oh man, we gotta get out of here. Um, but climate change is a tsunami. It's just not something that's that visual. Um, and people are going about their daily lives. Is that one of the real difficult prospects of what you do, trying to convince people this is a danger and it's ever present and it's getting worse? Probably because weather has always been varying. And so when we talk about climate change, people don't realize the magnitude of the problem that is ahead of us. Uh, there's this analogy we climate scientists we use a lot, which is very akin to your tsunami, the idea of the frog in hot water. So if you take a frog and you put it in boiling water, it's gonna, of course, die, but it's gonna try to jump out. But if you put a frog in cold water and you increase the heat slowly, the frog will stay there until it dies because it will not escape just because the change is gradual. So the problem with climate change is it's gradual. It's, it has already happened. It's happening, you know, we know that the last 10 years have already been increasingly, you know, climate disruption is increasing. So it's, it's this, the fact that it's not bang, a tsunami. You cannot say today on March 25 or whatever climate change arrive. That makes it really difficult for people to grasp. Since pre-industrial times, the global temperature of Earth has increased by one degree Celsius. To help stop the rising temperature, in 2015, Nation signed the UN Paris Agreement, making a pact to pursue efforts to limit the rise in global temperatures this century to no more than one and a half degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels. But at the current rate of warming, climate scientists say the planet could exceed that limit as early as 2030. What about the people who say, what's the big deal about 1.5 degrees Celsius? Yeah, of course, 1.5 degrees Celsius is nothing. Every day in North America, we live, you know, five, six degree difference between day and night and over a season, more in the northern latitude. In Quebec, here in Montreal, we have 60 degrees between the minus 30 of winter and the plus 30 of summer. So we need to understand that 1.5 is at the level of the entire atmosphere. So this huge mass of air, and so it's not the local temperature change. And just as an example, there was an ice age uh, about 10,000 years ago in North America. There was an ice cap all the way to Florida. In Montreal, there was one kilometer of ice above us where we stand now. And the global temperature was minus one degree colder. So minus one degree colder at the planet level was enough for bringing one kilometer of ice above us. So 1.5 degree warmer is that kind of a magnitude of change for the planet. So of course, the most extreme temperature change will be in the Arctic, where two days ago it was warmer in the Arctic than in Montreal, which makes no sense, right? And the temperature difference will be smaller in the tropics. So the, the effect of climate change will not be equal all around the planet. Uh, deforestation in Panama, melting in the Arctic. A lot of people don't see the linkage there. Talk to us about that. Yes, people, it, it's, what's fascinating about climate change, it's a fully global phenomena because we're talking about one molecule, carbon dioxide, and the property of that molecule is to trap heat. And so that molecule can be uh, emitted in the US, in Japan, in Panama, or captured for that matter anywhere. And it gets mixed up in the atmosphere of the planet. It moves around with the winds. Uh, so as industrialized civilized countries emit a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, this molecule goes, you know, on the planet in all of that big thick layer of air that we have and it traps the heat. So that change in climate that it brings about is what then causes you know, ice to begin to melt uh, in, the, you know, in the Arctic. 
and the link between the ice that is melting in the Arctic in the forests uh, in Panama is that the trees in Panama, they actually capture carbon dioxide, so they act as a pump to clean the atmosphere. So there's a kind of places in the planet where you emit carbon dioxide, places where you capture it. But the global problem is we're increasing it and it changes the climate everywhere. So uh, we should be concerned about the Arctic, but we should also be concerned if the pump's not working and deforestation uh, is a direct attempt to kind of gum up the works when it comes to the pump. So when the forest agenda landed, I would say, in the climate change agenda in 2005, the line that people were saying is deforestation accounts at the time in 2005 for 20% of emissions. So if we can stop deforestation, we have 20% of the solutions. Because if we stop deforestation, the forests keep pumping carbon dioxide and you know, it helps regulating climate. Uh, currently, forests are less of a problem. Uh, deforestation in Brazil has gone down a lot. There's been a lot of improvement. Forests are growing in China, forests are growing in India. So the forest estate is doing better, but overall we're emitting more. So forests are now an ally. The current decade, I would say, is the decade where everybody should plant trees because they are the only technology, if you accept me to say that, the only technology that can clean the atmosphere. Often called the lungs of the planet, tropical forests absorb global warming gases like carbon dioxide or CO2. Think of forests as nature's own carbon capture technology. Recent studies show restoring forests would remove 7 billion metric tons of CO2 each year from the atmosphere. That would be like taking one and a half billion cars off the roads. What was it that happened in your life that got you so interested in this subject matter? So I did my PhD at Duke University in North Carolina, and I worked in um, ecophysiology, so the physiology of plants. And my advisor, Dr. Boyd Strain, was working with the Department of Energy of the United States, looking at how increased carbon dioxide affects plant growth. So in, in simple term, plants photosynthesize, so they feed on carbon dioxide to grow. And the Department of Energy was interested in seeing if as we put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, plants would grow bigger. Um, so I had no choice. Anybody working in that lab worked with carbon dioxide. That was in the beginning of the 1980s. So we were just discovering that phenomena. And it is people like my advisor working on photosynthesis that became aware that something was happening in the chemistry of the atmosphere. So I, I really came to science as climate change was discovered. So it's, it was, I didn't choose it, I fell in it. And it, and it's, it did stick with me because um, way back in the 1980, I started to read uh, results of models that would say what would happen to the planet if climate change was real and if we kept putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that was very frightening. It's never stopped to be frightening. And it's even more frightening now because it's happening. So, so it's been a sort of a career long obsession, I would say. It's an obsession that's taken Catherine to the depths of the Panamanian tropical forest. She started working with the indigenous Embera tribe in the mid 1990s. Catherine's become so close with them that when she visits, she gets painted in the tribe's traditional blue designs. <laughs> you go to Panama and uh, this isn't something where you jump in your car and you just drive to this location. I mean, this is, this, <laughs> this is a journey to get to where you went. Um, and you mentioned working with indigenous uh, people. Um, you can't go in there and say, look, I'm the all knowing person. I mean, it's, it's relationship building as well, isn't it? Talk to me about the whole experience and how you approached it and how perhaps it changed you. So 
the first time I went to a far away indigenous community in Panama, um, I realized there was something I had not captured before, which was my Western way of looking at them. And I realized people needed to be part of the equation, not just indigenous people, but people in general. If, if you want a planet to be healthy, people in it need to be happy, something like that. Um, and indigenous people learned I was a botanist and they brought to me a question about one palm species going extinct and asked me to do something about it. Okay, so I figured, well, if I have a PhD in botany, I must be able to do something about one palm species. And I decided to engage with a young Embera man. So the Embera is the nation I most work with. Uh, he had done um, a, a bachelor degree in Austin, Texas, because he had met a Peace Corp. So he had a graduate degree, was the only person of his nation with a bachelor degree in anthropology. And I asked him to work with me. And basically he became my cultural interpreter. And very much at the beginning of this work on this palm, we went together in a village. And uh, I explained to the people, we wanted to find ways to rescue the palm, blah, blah, blah. And people were oblivious to what I was saying. I could see no reactions in their eyes, no spark, no nothing, although my Spanish was good enough. And he stood up and he started to speak. And within two minutes, everybody was were nodding and yes, and you could see they were engaging. And he had begun to discuss with them cultural survival, when, whereas I had spoken with them about the tree. He linked that tree with their culture. And as he linked that tree with their culture, people began to say, yes, absolutely, that tree allows us to you know, build our houses. And you're right, if, if we lose those, those roofs, then we just become poor. So um, I guess he was a bit, he was my student in the Occidental world, in the Western world, but he certainly was my master in intercultural exchange. And, and I realized that there are many ways, many opinions, many, um, many look, and the strongest is the one that emerged from different vision. In Canada, there's a Mi'kmaq elder from uh, the East Coast and the Maritimes, and he's talking about two eyes seeing, and he's saying one eye Western and one eye indigenous, and there's a lot of wisdom to that. Catherine's recent work with the Embera tribe focuses on measuring how much carbon is captured by the forest. El, el diámetro de este árbol. The data on carbon capture was an important step to give the tribe entrance into the global carbon market. In other words, having data on captured carbon can help the Embera get paid for carbon offsets purchased by polluters. Catherine trained tribe members to take measurements of individual trees. They then used this data to estimate how much carbon is stored in particular areas of the forest. When we're looking at you know, a, a problem like climate change and the role of forest, of course, what we need to know is our forest stable, our forest being cut, and how much carbon is there in forest. So it's, it's very hard. You cannot go in a forest and cut the tree to weigh them to know how much carbon, right? Because that defeats the purpose. What you want is to maintain the stocks of carbon that are in the forest. So we've relied to airborne satellites or um, airplanes to fly over big landscape and take images and then from those images try to understand what they mean. So there's an, a need for field grounding, ground truthing we call that, going in the field underneath either an airplane with a LIDAR, uh, which is a specific uh, instrument that can measure the forest in three dimension, or under a satellite imagery and say, okay, under, at this point, this is what I see in the field. And then you compare that to what the image is saying. So we've done a lot of ground testing with indigenous people. Uh, and we found a few things that are quite interesting. So imagery, satellite imagery, that we in the Western think are super uh, powerful, get a bit mixed up sometimes. For example, they can get mixed up around a lake. 
for a simple reason. If the lake has no waves, the image of the forest gets reflected on the lake. We've all seen that. And so the satellite thinks the lake is smaller because the edge, they see the trees in it, but it's just the image of the trees, okay? But of course, the indigenous people know very well where's the lake and where's the land. Or uh, in um, cultivation field like follow, Sweden follow agriculture, where the forest is cut and you regrow and cut. Indigenous people have a good track record of what is what. So we did some analysis with sophisticated algorithm to characterize land use on satellite and ground truthed it with indigenous people. And actually indigenous people categorization of the land was more precise than the category um, of the, the satellite imagery. Um, I'm not m saying that we should work all the time with indigenous people, but I'm saying they have incredible knowledge that we should take advantage of collectively in this endeavor, which is to protect the planet. <laughs>In 2017 alone, 39 million acres of tropical forest disappeared, an area the size of Belgium. The biggest reason for cutting down trees is not for the trees themselves, but for the land, which is used for crops and cattle. You tell another story about how you get the indigenous people to buy in, let's protect the forest and yet uh, trees were still being chopped down, um, which shows another tension on the ground that a lot of us are unaware of. Uh, talk to us about that. So in many Latin American country, the constitution uh, gives um, right to improve the land. So you have to think about constitutions that are 100 years old, where countries wanted to develop, not unlike you know, the push to the West in North America, and as a way to incentivize colonization, um, any farmers that would go in a forest, cut it, and then put cows or maize would improve the land, which is ironical in an age of climate change. And so as this land is being improved, then people are, um, can, can ask property for that land. And so in Panama, indigenous people don't cut the forest. They like the forest standing, but their neighbors that are Latino farmers, they see this and they say, oh, lazy indigenous people, why don't they cut the forest? And they really have this incentive to go in, cut the forest, put their cow, and then the land becomes theirs. So there's a lot of frontier problems. There's a lot of tension between Latino farmers and indigenous people all around the America because of very different um, opinion about what is a good use for the land. Is it to protect the forest or is it to enter as a way to enter the, you know, the Western economics. So um, there are a lot of programs in the world. Maybe some of the best known are in Brazil uh, and, and in Costa Rica, in Latin America, uh, that have worked quite well, actually. So bringing back money to people in exchange for them to maintain the forest as it stands. You, you straddle two worlds in a sense, because you're there uh, a big chunk of the year and then you're here and, um, how does that change you? Or do you have a diff is there a culture shock coming back to Canada or going there? Or? I've been, uh, you know, living a very, I think, passionate life, I would say, because uh, at some point in my life, I was a bit in Montreal as a McGill University professor. And then I was in Panama in, you know, very, very far jungle, which is hours of dugout canoe in places completely remote and living very traditional lifestyle. And I was a negotiator at the UN Convention of Climate Change, you know, you know, standing there speaking on behalf of a country. So I've really lived a life at, at very many levels. It's been exciting. It's been fun. I love the adventure of the jungle. It's been a huge responsibility to try and carry these voices to people together to, to say, it's okay, you're, we're gonna be okay if only we dare to change.